Welcome everyone to this week's lecture, Eurasian Empires 500 BCE to 500 CE. Now I'm guessing that maybe you've seen this image or one like it uh, before showing uh, a most remarkable burial tomb. In this case, the tomb of China's first emperor in history, Qin Shi Huangdi, buried here in the year 210 BCE. Not content to go into the great beyond, or at least the great underground alone, the Emperor Qin ordered that he be accompanied with an army of soldiers and cavalry horses. Well, you know, if not an actual army of living and breathing soldiers and horses, then a facsimile army of terracotta that is made from clay uh, sculptures of soldiers and you know, their cavalry horses, that is cavalry soldiers, infantry soldiers, each of them, by the way, designed to an exacting individual likeness, no two the same. Uh, and it was in that burial tomb that the remains of the first Chinese emperor well, remain concealed, if you will, uh, from history uh, for roughly the next 2,200 years nearly. It wasn't until the 1970s that a Chinese construction crew accidentally broke into uh, the, uh, that is, uh, with their digging equipment, uh, broke into uh, a part of the uh, burial tomb and thus discovered this remarkable imperial uh, burial chamber. Now, you might be thinking, uh, yeah, it's a little familiar, but uh, I don't know the person. Well, even if you don't know the Emperor Qin, you know his name, because every time we say the word China, we're borrowing from the Emperor Qin. It was his name that gave way to the calling of this empire, China, in history. So from the Emperor Qin to China, we have now the imperial beginnings of a very long history indeed. We're going to start off here with a couple of basic questions. Uh, one of them uh, straightforward, what is an empire in history? The other one uh, maybe not so straightforward. Are we Rome? And by that of course I mean is the United States itself to be included in a list of history's empires. Well, even though we're looking at the period 500 BCE to 500 CE, that is a thousand year period, uh, the last part of that quite removed from our own time in history. It's been 1500 years since the fall of the Roman Empire, for example. Uh, nevertheless, the tradition of empire has lived on. And so the question, are we Rome, really is more of a thought question for us to get our minds around this subject, you might say. By asking, are we Rome, is the United States, which proclaims itself formally to be a republic, is the United States of America, in fact, an empire? Now, we're going to have a lot to say about this as we go along, and it's, it's, and it's really to have a, you know, both a, a serious purpose, but also to have a bit of fun, because we'll see the, the myriad ways that the United States deliberately fashioned itself uh, upon ancient Rome, that is at the time of our founding. Uh, the name Republic, for example, was a Latin name that came from early Roman history. But in a more fund fundamental sense than are we an empire, the United States of America proclaimed its independence from England in 1776. And in the following year, the name United States of America was coined by the uh, Congress at that time. Because the United States had been formed in a war of independence against the English Empire, that is a war with the English Empire against English rule, then it was customary for Americans, whether statesmen or politicians or authors, writers, novelists, historians, etc., to, uh, and heck, for that matter, maybe your high school government teacher, I don't know, uh, to say the United States was a republic uh, 
uh, and not an empire. We were the antidote to empire, you might say, having won our freedom and independence by fighting an anti-imperial war of independence. And yet over time, it seemed the United States, for all of that, seemed to act suspiciously like an empire. Would you like an example? Yes, Professor Paget, we would. Okay. Well, instead of terracotta soldiers buried with an emperor underground, how about a flotilla of naval power encapsulated here in this image of the USS Ronald Reagan, uh, a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier making its way back into port in 2008 uh, with the Pacific Fleet in San Diego. Standing at the rails are these crackerjack uh, 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 Navy sailors uh, as the ship makes its way uh, into port. Well, okay, not a burial tomb for sure, more like a, a city afloat, I think you would call the, the Ronald Reagan aircraft carrier. Uh, but both cases, whether the uh, burial tomb of the uh, Emperor Chin or the modern aircraft carrier, both suggesting a claim of uh, military uh, greatness uh, for sure. All right, well, let's look at then some bullet points here that might help us understand more formally what we mean by empire. Historians agree that typically an empire must first of all represent an enormous multicultural society. So, you know, size matters here. These are not small states, these are big states, extended states, multicultural states, that is whose boundaries come to encompass people who are not of the same culture or ethnicity or say language as the core people. Uh, so a multicultural society a society of technological achievement. You know, there's so many examples you might point to from the great, you know, road building of the Roman Emperor or the, or the Roman Empire, the, the uh, uh, you know, the, the construction of Roman aqueducts bringing fresh water uh, into the cities. In, in the Chinese uh, uh, Empire of Qin, Shi Di, you had, um, a new uh, standardization take place in, in technology. So that, for example, the uh, axle length of merchant carts had to conform to a particular size so that they could travel on uniformly built roads. Economically draining and overstretched armed forces. Well, <laughs> it's it's probably appropriate then when we have an aircraft carrier, an enormously expensive, uh, you know, modern, uh, technologically uh, brilliant form of military strength. You might say uh, the the nuclear powered carrier itself not only a technological marvel but an extraordinarily expensive one too and as we'll see empires tend to struggle mightily you know to foot the bill for their own military um, existence stretching armed forces over larger and larger areas of the globe Most empires have a sense of uniqueness or being endowed with some greater global or even cosmic mission. We think of something like manifest destiny in the 19th century history of the United States, a kind of cosmic claim on, on a continental vision or mission of expansion. That sort of thing, as it turns out, is rather common to those states that become empires. Yeah, and empires, for all their strength and all their expansion, often find themselves constantly absorbed or obsessed with borders and thus with the peoples who live on the other sides of those borders, whether they be people who are attempting to cross the borders or purely harass those borders or even to wage war against those borders. Borders, borders, borders. 
Uh, and yeah, well, you guessed it. With borders often come walls, the most famous in history being the Great Wall of China. I guess that question, are we an empire or are we Rome? Start to make a little bit more sense, right? A determination to maintain that military support, superiority, to guard those borders, to defend those borders, or to expand those borders often accompanies empire building. And finally, it's perceptible to see in the history, the, particularly the late stage history of empires, a tendency toward what we'll call corruption, be it political, economic, not to mention a tendency toward a greater centralization of power and dictatorial rule or autocratic rule, that is the rule of one, usually some strongman who has either been responsible for the military greatness or has seized the power to maintain the personal privilege of rule. It doesn't always happen, but it is also rather quite common to the histories of empires. All right, so here are then some bullet points that'll carry us along as we look at the history of ancient empires and as we try to assess America's own place in the longer history. Now, your textbook author, Robert Stroer, offers a kind of definition, a working definition, we'll call it, of empire. An empire in history, he says, is a, quote, large and aggressive state that generally encompassed a considerable variety of peoples and cultures within a single political system and often associated with political and cultural oppression. There's some quick images here from the empires of the ancient world. Uh, the Assyrian soldiers carrying away the gods of their enemies. So the kind of cultural conquest, if you will, uh, by the Assyrian army of foreigners. Uh, the great lion of Babylon here, the glazed brick relief, showing the preeminent symbol of power in the ancient world, that of the lion. And the monumental seated figures here uh, from the uh, upper Nile Valley and the palace of Ramses II of Egypt. And we visited uh, the Egypt of Ramses when in the uh, last unit we looked at the Bronze Age uh, wars between the Hittites and the Egyptians. Uh, these were, these were uh, sort of empires in the making, if you will. Uh, we might call them proto-imperial states. They didn't quite match the uh, level of accomplishment or expansion that the later empires will, but they clearly laid down a template. I mean, the thing that the Ramses was, was famous for was leading armies beyond the boundaries of Egypt into, uh, you know, into, into Palestine, for example. Uh, that will become so familiar in the empires to come, the empires of the Iron Age that follow the empires of the Bronze Age, of Ramses II, of the Hittites. What historical functions have empires served? Now here's a great stat. A majority of the world's people before the 20th century lived in empires governed by rules culturally different from themselves. Think about that for a second. From the beginnings of civilization, you know, 5,000 years ago in Mesopotamia, from, from that period until the 20th century, the majority of people who lived on the earth lived in an imperial system governed by rulers culturally different from themselves. So if you lived in the Roman Empire, for example, chances are you weren't actually Roman. You may have been of uh, you know, from the, the lands north of Rome, even from the Italian peninsula where you didn't regard yourself as Roman. You know, Rome was a, a city-state, right? Maybe you were from the south or the north of Rome. And thus didn't consider, maybe you spoke a different dialect of language. You know, maybe you were Greek, maybe you were North African. You know, maybe you were from 
the Near East. In other words, most of the people who lived in the Roman Empire weren't from the city of Rome, didn't speak Latin, and didn't identify themselves as native Romans. And yet, it was then that native Roman ruling clique that will build itself in an imperial juggernaut and rule most of the Mediterranean and much of what comes to be Europe uh, during the era of its, its greatness. And that was true for most people, not just Romans, people living in the Roman Empire, but whether it be you know Asian people living in, in the Chinese realm or any of the Central Asian empires, uh, the Persian Empire, or even in Africa. And native North America, you know, or, or native Mesoamerica, let's say, if you if you were born in, in the lands of what is today Mexico or Central America, chances are you lived under the imperial dominion of, let's say, the Mayans, even though you may not ethnically have identified that way. So, yeah, we can we can target the the globe, and and find no shortage of imperial states following the definition we laid down earlier that will come to govern people whether they were ethnically homogeneous or as was typically the case multicultural diverse and foreign jewish captives under assyrian guard was even noted in the hebrew bible in the 14th year of king hezekiah's reign in the book of isaiah chapter 36 verse 1 that king sennacherib of Assyria attacked and captured all the fortified towns of Judah, what was then the Hebrew kingdom of Judah. Powerful militaries, great commanders, and campaigns of conquest. Julius Caesar was first among Romans to have had himself imprinted in profile on a Roman coin. Below you see a Persian soldier, one of the so-called immortals of the Persian Empire. And maybe most famously among the imperial uh, figures, Alexander the Great, the young emperor who led his Macedonian uh, soldiers on campaigns of conquest, first across Greek, uh, the Greek uh, mainland, and then uh, across the Aegean into Asia Minor and Anatolia, uh, where he is said to have cut the Gordian knot, according to legend, he who could untie the Gordian knot would be ruler of Asia. And uh, certainly Alexander the Great made his bid, not stopping until he reached nearly the boundaries of Western China, what is now modern day Afghanistan, where he left behind garrisons of soldiers who would one day create the Kushan kingdom. Alexander himself died in Persia upon his return, but not after leveling much of the imperial palace of Persepolis, which we will take a look at when we look at Persia. But according to legend, Alexander had his soldiers uh, level the Persepolis palace as payback for the Persian Empire's invasion of Greece a couple centuries earlier. So yeah, among uh, other things, I don't get big egos, but big stories and histories that follow uh, the career of these empires. And yet because of their size and power, empires also serve to spread culture. Again, your textbook author Strayer, these imperial states brought together people of quite different traditions and religions, and so stimulated the exchange of ideas, cultures and values. Yeah, you know, look, empires stretch across foreign lands, foreign territories, foreign peoples, foreign languages, foreign cultures, and over time come to absorb these things. As ethnocentric as an imperial ruling caste might be, uh, you know, it's often the case that they become just as much influenced by the foreign cultures they absorb as vice versa. That is, Roman emperors wearing Chinese silks and that sort of thing. Or as Strayer puts it, from a small Jewish sect into a world religion. He's talking here about the origins of Christianity following the death of Jesus of Nazareth, whose followers began to build a kind of school of teaching around the reported lessons, the gospel, as the Christians called it, of Jesus. And from that small beginning, over time will grow uh, 
into a global religious movement. And what is the key catalyst? Well, I mean, I suppose if you ask a devout uh, Christian, the answer is simple. Well, it's the, it's the word of God. But in historical terms, what is the catapult that creates this momentum to take Christianity from what it was originally, a small Jewish sect, into something like a world religion. Well, you're looking at the image here of a famous moment in the course of that history involving a Roman emperor, Constantine, who reported seeing a vision in the nighttime sky, a vision uh, on the night before a great battle that Constantine's army was to wage, the Battle of the Milvian Bridge just outside Rome as the Emperor Constantine sought to consolidate his power as the Roman Emperor. And the image he saw in the nighttime sky, the so-called Cairo, that is the letters, the Greek letters, Cairo, that he said symbolized the name Christ, or more properly, the Greek word title Christ, which meant the anointed of God. So the Cairo also, by the way, you can just barely make it out in the picture here. Uh, the Cairo was a traditional Roman symbol as well. The Sol Invictus or unconquered sun. And when you put syncretically these two images together, that of the Greek letter Cairo, the traditional Latin Roman Invictus, Sol Invictus, I should say, then what you got was a powerful new symbol of imperial conquest and religiosity. Because what Constantine said was that this now Christian symbol would come to accompany the future growth of the Roman Empire. And, and boy did it ever. Here we see an aerial view of St. Peter's Cathedral, uh, otherwise known as the Vatican in modern day Rome, uh, which is the world headquarters, of course, of the Roman Catholic Church. Now no, notice, Roman Catholic Church, Roman Emperor Constantine. Yeah, it was the marrying of the Christian faith to the apparatus of the Roman state that will begin to consolidate these gains into great institutional building and an institutional building that will result in global expansion. And just look at the architecture. I mean, that's really why I'm showing it to you. St. Peter's Cathedral done up with the Roman dome and the Greek colonnades, the great traditions of Greek and Roman architecture that always exemplified the power of the Greek and Roman state now being brought to bear on behalf of a church, including the so-called basilica style of architecture, these long colonnades, sometimes curved into semicircles, for example, centered around a great public square. These uh, are classically Greek and Roman governmental styles of architecture associated with Greek and Roman imperial claims that will now simply be grafted onto the Roman church's uh, authority and claim. Catholic itself is a word that means universal. And just as the Roman state had proclaimed itself to be universal, so now too will the church that it spawns, the Roman Catholic Church. All right, so that gets us through part one of our discussion of empire. Now in part two, we will continue with a discussion of a specific ancient empire. Some would say perhaps the greatest of the ancient empires, that of Persia.